So there's those little angels in your life that always whisper in your ear and they're the greatest people in the world that, you know, go, you know, maybe you're not that good at this. You know what you're good at? You're good at this. I've known you since you were a little boy. Is, do you love what you're doing? I'm enjoying surfing more than I ever have in my life and I look at it completely different. Today's guest is John Wayne Freeman. John is a longtime Southern California surfer who has recently become famous in the surfing world for his comedic and satirical take on the surfing culture at large. And comedians are such important figures in society because they have the gumption and the leeway to point out some of our biggest failings. So we have a lot to learn with through John's Instagram channel. But not only is it in, is he educational, his story is very inspirational. Because John had the courage to follow his dreams of being a comedian and an entertainer, to exit the security blanket of the 9 to 5 world and head towards self-actualization. And it's through this journey that we become better surfers. And not just better surfers, but better humans. Because surf mastery is about life mastery, and vice versa. So the first part of our conversation is quite lighthearted. But uh, John is also very intelligent and philosophical. We started recording this conversation as we were talking about big wave surfing. And without further ado, John Wayne Freeman. Tom Carroll is a perfect example of a guy and Ross Clark Jones, who they're so gnarly. They go surf, that adrenaline dump is so profound and they wanna keep that going. How did they keep that going? Through the party. That's really, it's why our dopamine levels in our brains are so important and people need to understand those. Like you get high from surfing, it is a drug. That's why people keep coming back again and again. But for those guys, it's a completely different level. Like. I can't imagine what they feel like for days afterwards of surfing huge waves. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Tom Carroll's inspirational now. He's sort of replaced that all with meditation. He's been incredibly inspirational. I've talked to him a few times on Instagram. I hope to meet the man one day. I had him on my wall when I was a kid, a poster. I had him in my school in one of my classrooms. One of my, my English teacher was a huge fan. So I brought him a poster of Tom. And now he's just like so positive, no judgment. We'll, we'll talk to anybody, like really special soul. And it's it's wonderful to see. Yeah, he is. Actually, Tom was my second guest ever on the show. He no was, way. He's such a good dude. He's the only guy that gets a stand-up paddle pass from me. I think he, him and maybe one other guy. I'm joking, but seriously, like Tom can do whatever he wants. Like, But he's a yeah. waterman, you know? Does, does Laird get a pass? Laird gets a pass since uh, he's Laird and he's outside the realm of the surf industry. He is an enigma, a very special human, and he brought it to the forefront. We can we can thank Laird or blame Laird, as the bumper stickers say that you see around here, that surfers put on their cars because they're upset that the masses were introduced to stand-up paddleboarding. But why would they be upset? I mean, what's the big deal of a basically a small vessel captained by a person that doesn't know what they're doing and never learned how to surf coming straight for your head when you're just trying to enjoy a calming surf. I mean, it's not like it could do damage if it hits you square in the head. It's not like it could kill you. It's not like it's a big deal if a stand-up paddleboarder who never even learned to boogie board or stand-up surf but is standing on this giant thing is sharing a lineup with you. I mean, what what, what kind of problems could we have in a situation like that? Nothing. Not, uh, it's the problem. Yeah. I think it's the perfect narcissistic surf craft. <laughs> dude, you, okay, thank you. Every dude, and ladies too, chests out, I am Poseidon, looking down on the people below me. I will try to talk to them in the lineup, and nine times out of ten, they're like, they either don't respond, or they're just like, oh, 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 oh. I am the king of the sea. Oh, why? Because you're up there, and I'm down here? Yeah, that's sure. That's that's what's going on. But yeah, you're right. You nailed it. It attracts a certain type of human. But again, I know a lot of wonderful stand up paddleboarders. And I personally have made a decision to do it only in a lake. 
And that is all. I agree. It belongs in a lake. Yes. But I mean, they're, they're literally above everyone else, right? That's, they, they are, uh, you know, metaphorically, physically, spiritually, they are at a higher plane. It's called the water human plane or water man, depending on your preferred nomenclature. But yeah, they're just better people all around. They're cross training and they get to see in a way that nobody else understands. But a lot of surfers can be the nicest guy you've ever met in the car park. And then as soon as they're in the water, just a different person. Sure. What is up with that, what is up with that is it's uh, human beings' egos. And it's fun. It's fun to watch. My favorite thing in the world is to watch the person that's getting progressively worse at surfing that was once pretty good, maybe had a shot in a magazine, maybe made, uh, you know, uh, his name was in the newspaper in 1992, and he's still clinging to it. He's got stickers all over his board. He's ready to go, and it is a battle when he's in the lineup. He's still in a heat on the Bud Tour in Southern California. It's 1989. He's got Christian Fletcher there, and he can't do the airs because he never was going to, and he still can't do the airs, but he tries to do the airs, and he's now in his 50s, and it's fun for everybody in that lineup because – can't we all learn from him? Because he really has a sick top to bottom game. Just the bottom turns crisp, schwack, schwack. He's all comped out. He's still in that heat. He's in the Bud Tour, and we get to bear witness to his greatness. Yeah, I love those fellas. Love them. <laughs> Getting progressively worse. It's so yeah. true. Well, as they age, the board stays the same. It does. The board, I'm mystified. I'll tell you, here's LA surfing in a nutshell. I was at a very popular spot that is basically a closeout nine times out of 10. And there must have been 70 people, young people too. And they're all riding just like in the 90s when people were riding the glass slippers that Kelly Slater's had. That's still happening. I thought that was over. I thought with our hybrid boards, our mid lengths, long boards, soft tops, I didn't realize people were still walking into surf shops that had been surfing surfing air quotes for five months and buying a top of the line uh, board that is a potato chip thruster. And it's fun to watch them. They catch no waves. They go over the falls. But really, it's about the car park. It's about holding the board. It's about telling the people at school that you surf, telling girls that you surf, and then walking from the parking lot confidently, getting in the water, performing in absolutely no way, shape, or form well in the water. Technically, like I've always said, you're not a surfer, you're a floater. You're a floater. You float. You float really good. And then about 2% of the time, you go over the falls. And then every now and then, you stand on your little feet. And it's disturbing to watch. Um, but that is that is still happening. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it is what it is. But as a person who did the exact same thing from 14 years old, to 21 years old, I can tell you it is in fact not the way to become a better surfer. You will just get frustrated and ultimately you'll end up with more foam and you'll realize, wow, I should have done this a decade ago. But so you realized it at 21? 21 years old, man. I'm in college and I'm still riding. By the way, my traction placement, I was so clueless. There were guys I surfed with that ripped. And I made my college surf team because this dude blew his knee out and I begged to be his replacement. And they were like, this, this kook, like he just keeps, he won't leave us alone. He's like a leech we can't get rid of. So they allowed me to be on it, but I had that, I had that rear traction placement well placed above the tail because my back foot was getting nowhere over the fins and I could catch waves. I could do this, that. I had a Nev. Do you remember Nev from Australia? I was yeah. su super psyched on that Nev my thruster. And one day, lo and behold, somebody handed me a fish. It was about 5'10", full rails, beautiful foam. And I went out and I was like, I'm the greatest surfer in the world. I go so fast. I can go backside. I can go front side. Wow. How did it all come together for me today, John? And then I took a long, long, long time to think about it. And I went, oh, You've been on the wrong boards your whole life. You should have started just like Rick Kane in North Shore on a traditional log at a slopey wave, like Waikiki style, learn to turn that big single fin 
and then moved on to a mid-length, or what do they call them in New Zealand? What's a mid-length? Yeah, or sometimes it's called a mini-mal. A mini-mal, yeah, that's right. Australia, they use that in New Zealand as well? Yeah. Okay, so a mini-mal, I should have gone to that, and I should have stayed away from the high-performance brakes, but Johnny was watching, what, surf videos by Lost, Taylor Steele videos, and all his heroes rode little potato chips. So he rode a potato chip, and every now and then he'd get aboard with a little bit more foam, which probably belonged to some ripper who weighed 250 pounds, and then I thought I was killing it, but I wasn't. I just never put the pieces together until that moment on the fish. And then, of course, what did I become? I became the fish guy for years. But that comes with its own set of problems, you know? You learn bad habits when you jump on something else. But now, thank God, I'm a complete surfer from 2 to 20 feet. I have it all dialed, and that's why I'm on your podcast, and I appreciate you seeing that in me. <laughs> Let me ask you, what's, who was your... um. Who was your favorite surfer when you were growing up? Like, and not just in terms of the way they surfed, but who like inspired you to be a better surfer, like all rounded surfer? Anything, anyone come to mind? My brother-in-law taught me to surf. He rips. He's a high performance guy, surfs really well. And he told me when I started, go to trestles, go to trestles, just find a longer wave where you can learn to bottom turn, do floaters, link sections. And I did not listen to him. It was 20 minutes from my house. I'm like, ah, there was, this is pre e-bike. You got to understand. I mean, I was only 16 years old, full of energy, you know, best shape of my life, but I couldn't make that walk, you know, and I was terrible at skateboarding. I pushed Mongo. I'm like, I'll die if I'm trying to hold a surfboard, bomb this hill on a skateboard. And I was lazy. So I would go to the closest place, which was very localized beach break with a soft point. And I learned how to get hammered. It served me well, like going to heavy beach breaks and like I, I can take a throttling. I'm good at like just being a rag doll. So I got that going for me, which is nice. Um, and that's probably how I became an ocean lifeguard because I just, I got hammered. But as a kid, my favorite guy was a dude named Tim Curran. He was an air wizard. Okay. From Oxnard. And his brothers all ripped too. And I would watch his video over and over. And he wasn't a partier. He was a good guy. My parents are very conservative. And they're like, we like these videos. But with him, he's positive. Unlike the, the lost videos you're hiding, where everyone's taking bong rips and smashing beers. We think he's a good example. And I was like, I'm going to fly like Timmy. That was never going to happen. Because I literally, when I think back at all the sessions, it makes me so sad. But I was so stoked on surfing, I did not even realize how bad I was at it. Tim Curran, he's, he's, he's a goofy foot, rode for Quicksilver for years, him and Kelly Slater. Just six sections, big waves, small waves. He was on the tour for years. I love the Malloys, who are also from that area, all three of them. Um, your goofy footers, you know, I loved, I love Slater. I love Shane Dorian. Um, I love Nathan Fletcher. I just had, uh, I loved Mark Healy when I got older because of just his guts and his determination. Um, but again, my brother-in-law was like, study Curran, just study him, John. And I was like, Tom Curran, that dude from the eighties, I'm in the nineties now. This is the new wave, you know, not realizing that they all studied Curran. He loved Archie. Archie was his dude. And again, I should have studied Archie, but Truthfully, I was never had the skill or ability to ever be a decent short boarder. Like I should have in a dream scenario met somebody, you know, in San Diego who had been riding a fish for, you know, 35 years at that point. And that would have been what I would have wanted to do. Just, oh, we go fast, we cruise, we hit the in section. We fly like a birdie, like a like a pelican, like a peli peli when we're out there in the water. Graceful. I mean, you caught on early, really. No, not for here, I, dude. I was so late, bro. 14 years old, you might as well not even start in Southern California. It's just like anything. We live in this section of coast. It's like any sport, baseball, football, whatever. Surfing, sponsored surfers, to me, were the coolest things in the world. I wore all the clothes. I wasn't one. I was a full poser. But at 14, people were like, it's too late, kid. 
you're in the eighth grade. You just stood up on a, on a, on a surfboard. They were called Doyles back then. Cause Doyle, Mike, I believe is Mike Doyle. That's what your wave storm is today. But you didn't, you couldn't buy it at Costco. The junior lifeguards had them. What's that word in Australia? What do we call them? The little kids that are into lifeguarding and they compete in the games on the beach. Oh, clubby? Clubby. Clubby. They're the only ones that have the soft tops in Southern California. But you could rent them occasionally. So I rented one by San Clemente Pier, stood up and was like, I am a surfer. And then I declared it. And I went straight from that to a tiny thruster and stayed there. Sorry, this is a reoccurring theme. I'm really angry with myself and I'm upset with you having me on the show, reliving all these horrible memories because I could have been a contender. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Did you actually want Ryan, to- I could have been Ryan Birch before Ryan Birch. I believe that in my heart, man. <laughs> oh. Oh. Rob Machado too. I can't forget Rob Machado ever. I just thought he had perfect style and I'm a goofy foot. So he still yeah. does. He does. And in person, have you seen him surf in person? Yeah. It's ridiculous. It sure is. Yeah. Especially when you see those guys surf small waves that you're having trouble catching on your soft top and they just go out and get blood out of a stone, basically. It's amazing. And that was his world in two foot surf. Nobody was going to be Rob Machado ever. And now we have the Brazilian storm, you know, but this was early on and Rob Machado. And that was the big thing. Can he surf bigger waves? Yes, he can. He can get kegged just like a lot of people, you know, well-rounded. Yeah, totally. When did your comedy start? Around the same time as surfing? Always, always. I, like around, I just, that's something that I've always loved. And just, you make people laugh. You make friends easy. And leaning towards wanting to be the class clown, that's just been my whole life, um, you know, and I think that's the only reason I stuck with surfing, because I had a sense of humor about myself, because I was, again, locals just, back in the day, I saw people get dunked, I saw people get punched, I was just, like, trying to bob and weave in the lineup, and hoping that someone would talk to me or smile at me, but I was into high school theater, I was... I'm a song and dance man. It's pretty good, right? That's I got pipe. That's beautiful. Thanks. Perfect pitch. This is pre. This is pre uh, when those things were were not as fondly looked upon. But I didn't care because I'm just like the best class in the world to me is you get to get on a stage, and it's a class you get you get to go. So I would just load from the time I was in seventh grade every class. I'd get as many drama classes as I could. And you get attention and you get an A and you're like, I'm good at this. I'm not good at math, but I make the teacher laugh and they let me. And so that just blossomed. And then at some point, um, I always surfed. Surfing is never from 14 to 42. It's the thread that goes through my life. But at some point, I chose to put that that muscle, which I never should have done this, the, the humor muscle in my back pocket because I was trying to be something I wasn't. And then a few years back, I was just like, I got to chase my dreams. I got to go after what I want and look around and, and, and figure out if this is really what I was put on the earth to do. So I did. And, uh, it has worked out very well so far for me, just doing the things I love and, um, yeah, the, the, the road is winding and the road is crazy, but I all those detours, they seem to all have worked out for good because I learned so much stuff along the way. That's such a hard thing to do, man. Like to go from, because I know you, you went, you a fireman, a paramedic, you went into the, you know, the <clears throat> a section of the stock standard nine to five thing and put your dreams aside. To go from that to doing what you love, like, that's real hard, man. And it's very inspirational to see you do that. I think it helped you along. So there's those little angels in your life that always whisper in your ear and they're the greatest people in the world that, you know, go, you know, maybe you're not that good at this. You know what you're good at? You're good at this. I've known you since you were a little boy. Is Do you love what you're doing? And I'm like, no. And so you have those people that come into your life, which are priceless 
And most people aren't like that. Most people are, they're thinking about themselves. Maybe they are like that, but they're, they're not going to take the time to pull you aside and tell you that. So I had people along the way and then also just being so obviously bad at a lot of these jobs, there was always a moment where a supervisor pulls you aside and is like, this is not for you. And I would take that as an insult. It's not an insult. They're just a person who's being honest with you because those people who pulled me aside, they were good at their job and they loved their job and they were passionate about it. I clearly wasn't. I was on the fake it till you make it thing with all that stuff. And I'm pretty good at faking it, right? But there's always a moment when the real thing happens or testing or actual things. And it's like, yeah, this, this dude hasn't studied. His heart's not in it. Um, so yeah, that's what would happen. But the transition to like being scared because I have two kids, I have bills, I have all these things. And how, how are we going to take this leap? Again, I just thought to myself, I cannot tell my children to follow their dreams if I never follow mine. And up to this point, um, I haven't done that. I've been trying to be somebody else for way too long. And it's, it's not sitting well in my soul, like for real. And then just looking around going, you're positioned in a very unique place in history where I can, you know, potentially be on a podcast. I can, I can get whatever it is inside me to millions of people very easily. Well, what are you doing? All the tools are right here. You mean you can't take 10 minutes to learn something new that might change your life? So then you just start asking better questions and it changes your life. You say to yourself as you're going on a walk, well, what would happen if I did this? Well, potentially this would happen. What happens if I don't do this? I stay miserable in the same place I'm at. And guess what? I'll never know. Then I'll just get older. I'll be sad. I'll be at the end of my life and I'll look back and I'll be like, I don't understand how these other people did what they loved. Well, they did it. There was movement and action involved. It's just as simple as pie. Don't be a bad person. Be a good dude. Show up or lady, whatever. Dude's my unisex word. It covers everything. That's why I use it. For the record, dudes. See? It's fun. It's unisex. It covers everything. But you do that. You go out there and you do all those simple things that nobody else does. You show up early, you bring something with you, you over deliver and people are like, this guy's awesome. But that be, that came easy to me because it was fun because I wanted to do it because I'm following my passion. I never did that in my day job. Nobody ever came up and said, hey, John, you wanna be a supervisor? Not once. And I used to go, "What? How come? how come I never get to put on my list of employment that I was a supervisor? Because I never cared. I was just there collecting a paycheck. Yeah. You mentioned some angels in your life that helped you. Were they physical people or were they online gurus? or? No, I meant literal angels. I'm a very spiritual person. I do not like to use the religious words. I just say spiritual because I'm from an area in coastal California where it's warmer and there's a magnetic pole here. And I also do a lot of deep breathing. No, I meant actual people, like physical people that see something in you and I need to hear it. I need to hear it from somebody. And it's always the strangest people. I wasn't listening to mom and dad. I obviously was getting whatever they were telling me confused from the time I was very small because I thought I had to be my father, which I didn't. But it's these outside sources. Um, and for me, a lot of them were surfers because I've always looked up to surfers. So one of the greatest gifts of starting doing this, the social media thing, which I never did, was I get to have real conversations with people and they see things in you that you, you're like, wow, that's cool, man. Like, thank you. You just gave me motivation. You built my self-confidence up a little bit. And that wheel just keeps turning. You're, you're thankful to all these people around you who took five minutes, 10 minutes, had coffee, and were like, you know, like, keep going. 
do what you want to do. I would traditionally focus on the negative, and it took me a very long time to block the hate, harness the good, block the hate, harness the good. But this actually helps me with that because there's so much vile, just like, ah, that's our day and age. But it's understandable if you think about it. There's a lot of bummed out people and they see somebody who's genuinely happy or having a good time. I know this because I used to be one of those. I, that's why I started this. I would look at people and I'd be like, that's your, that's your funny guy. That's your, that's your YouTube family that's making $2 million a year. Clearly it's fake. Like I can see through the fake, like, that's a gift I've always had very quickly. And so I just tried to find the real ones, the real people, the authentic people and align myself with them. I never did that before. I always have kept the same circle of people and we, we, we tend to act like we're in seventh grade, literally. And we're in our twenties, thirties and forties. And we talk like we're 13 year olds when we're together. So how are you ever going to grow if you're, not around people who actually have already grown. So once I began to do that, surprise, surprise, suddenly I started to become more of a man. As odd as it sounds, I know. It's it's not hard math. It's very simple. But even even to break out of those, you know, your peers that are on that level you used to be on and approach someone who's inspirational and authentic, that in itself is hard, man. Like, what gave you the gumption to do that? I don't I don't have that in me. Since I was small, I, I would speak with adults of all ages. Um, that's just, that, that doesn't bother me. And I know it does a lot of people, but to anybody that that, anxiety is fear, right? Fear is anxiety. If you feel you can't approach somebody or talk to somebody, it's not, it's not true. You can. Their reaction is what you're afraid of. You're afraid they're going to say, leave me alone. You're afraid if you DM somebody, they're going to tell you to pound sand. That's not usually the case. And if that is the case, wonderful. Guess what? They're not who you want to talk to. If they don't have time for you, carry on. But you, you're you throwing seeds out all day long. You're like, douche, 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 douche. If the information's all here. But the human connection that's where everything happens. And you form a relationship with other humans who have similar energy, similar interests, similar heart. And that, that grows into something. And people want to help people. Successful people, you have a roadmap. You see where you want to go. You find that person. You speak with them. If they don't want to speak with you, that's not your person. You go find another person who's done the same thing. You talk to them and you will find a person who will be a mentor to you, who will help you along the way. You just have to show up and be willing. So if that's fear, that's your cliff, that's your little starting point. I'm afraid to jump off to speak to somebody. You jump. You jump all day. You're not going to get punched in the face. You're not going to get pulled into a room and tortured. Everything's good. They'll probably buy you a meal. You'll get a free meal and a bunch of wisdom. And then you, and then they, have, guess what? They have 30 friends who are just as awesome as they are and know as, as much as you could ever want. And then you get to meet them and then you get to meet their friends. And then before you know it, you're like, how am I, how, how am I two people away from that person? <gasps> That's all it is. That's how life works. Because I'm wondering, so this transition happened for you a couple, two, three years ago? So no, it happened, I was working as a night janitor. I had been hired and fired twice as a firefighter paramedic, which in California is a very good job. You work 10 days a month, you can make six figures easily and make more than that with overtime or not more than six figures. You can make 200,000 like that, right? So it's cost of living here is very high and I started seeing all my friends doing this. So of course I'm attracted to that because that means more time in the water, more surfing, right? But again, I love helping people. I do. I enjoy being a paramedic, but I my heart was never in it. So because of that, I end up depressed um, in 2017 and I'm a night janitor. 
And that's when everything clicked because I was by myself for eight hours a night in an empty school listening to podcasts just like this and hearing strangers talk like I'm talking right now. And something clicked in my brain that they're no different than me. I can go after what I want to go after. And I picked up all these tools as I was mopping and cleaning and vacuuming. And that's when I just was like, well, let's go. And then you start doing stuff. It's slow in the beginning, but you have listened to podcasts and you know life is a marathon, not a sprint. And everything takes about a decade to build, depending on what your financial uh, goals are. Like if you're looking at truly su success, what the standard definition is, it's not mine. But if you're looking at a monetary thing, you're looking at about 10 years, whether it's a business, whether you're trying to act, whether you're trying anything. So you have to get those reps in because besides a few people that are complete outliers, that are freaks, that just have gifts that most of us can never imagine, you need reps. Just like throwing a basketball into a hoop, comedy is the same thing. You have an audience in front of you and they'll tell you what they like or don't like. You have a podcast, your listeners will tell you what they enjoy and what they don't. So you make these little adjustments and I just started doing that. And then I stayed on the ambulance as a paramedic for two and a half more years. And then eventually I got to a place where I was like, wow, I could quit my job. And that, besides having my children and marrying my wife and quitting drinking, is perhaps my finest moment. And when I walked into the human resources where it says, why are you leaving your job? I wrote down to go find fame and fortune. And she laughed at me. And then she looked across the table and she saw I was serious. Because they don't know who I am. They don't know what's in me. Nobody knows who you are except for you. Your mom and dad know who you are because they saw you when you were born. And you have gifts that maybe you haven't shared with the world. So yeah, that's how that happened. Beautiful. You mentioned when you were a janitor, you were listening to a lot of podcasts. Who was inspirational for you during that? All over, all over the map. Like, again, I have been so focused on myself and just like, where do I, where do I go to get a good taco and get a good wave? I did not have basic understanding of finances, basic understanding of anything. So run the spectrum. Look at like, there's so many good podcasts. Um, but for me at the time, I was listening to a lot of comedy podcasts because my thought was, I want to be a stand-up comedian because um, I dabbled it with it in my 20s and I loved being in front of people, speaking, making them laugh. But I also knew I can't go out every night as a 38-year-old guy with two babies and a wife and spend all this time in bars. You need reps in front of live audiences. And that's something that really you should probably do when you're much younger, when you're single. And I'm like, I can't do that. So I'm like, okay, it's YouTube or Instagram. And I'm again, lazy. Don't want to edit YouTube videos. Don't even want to learn how to use YouTube. So I was like this thing in my hand, what is Instagram? Uh, is it, is, do you take pictures on it? Is it still a picture app? I, I remember in 2007, they said something about it's for photographers. So I look in 2017 and I'm like, let's just start posting an adult depressed man who's a janitor. So I just would make these sometimes very uncomfortable, but very funny looking back videos of a guy who's a night janitor. And I would sing songs I would, I would play on the playground. Sometimes it was creepy, but I got like, I got like 400 or 500 followers and they were like, dude, this is awesome. Cause what janitor is doing this? And then the surfing just came out because I surf and then surfers are the greatest. If surfers like you, they're very loyal and they're rad. And they just understood the way I was speaking, like you and me, when we started this podcast, we're talking about these obscure things that nobody understands if you don't surf, but that would come out through my Instagram. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, I don't know what I am, but like O'Neill just sent me clothes. <gasps> I always wanted clothes. I can't do it with my surfing ability, 
ding, 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 ding. Maybe I can do it by being a dork. And then that just has gone in different directions. And yeah, it's just like I said, you never know until you put yourself out. So many people are afraid to be in front of a camera. I never had that problem. I'm fortunate for that. And I like realness. People want to see the scars. People see want to see the truth. You know, don't be long-winded. Instagram's great for that. You can make it really short, a minute or less. Nobody really cares what you're eating that day. People love to show what they're eating. Just do something that is unique to you and you will be astounded that people want to watch. Yeah. So you say you're not afraid of the camera, but were you were you fearful of being that vulnerable? No, because I had been... I was at the bottom of the barrel, dude. I was like depressed, did not care, did not care. And in fact, right now, I should probably go back to more of that, not giving a... Like right now, my Instagram is a lot more cleaner. It's a lot more... And, and some days I'm like... Because I am giving less of a crap now. I don't, I don't care. In particular, what, what the surf industry cares about me. I could care less. I was never a part of it. It's not where I, the people I work for aren't in that. And guess what? What would I want to watch? This is what I always go back to. I would want to watch a person who do, does not care. Some of your earlier, earlier videos are so brutal and honest. Like the one, you know, the whiteboard, the whiteboard one about marriage. Yeah. That was, that is honest. And then your wife's rebuttal was so good. I mean, your wife's almost as funny as you. So here's a, here's a leak. The next video I'm going to do is back to the marriage thing. And it's post six, six months since I quit drinking. And we're just going to talk for real about what a pile I was and have, <laughs> have that back and forth with the whiteboard. Like you did this, 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 and this, which I did. And God bless her. She was always open to letting me be that person. And I, I mean, here in California, I get this endlessly. I get, if I meet a woman, she says, wow, my husband or my boyfriend really likes you, but I don't, I, I don't, I don't follow you. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Your, your husband has great taste because I was saying and doing the things that we think as husbands at times but nobody says it. But to me, that's the funniest stuff because it's the truth, you know? That seems strange. I mean, they know who you are, they know what you're about, and they don't like you. Well, they probably actually love your vulnerability. They hate you, but they love that you are. I don't know about that. I mean, they don't, they're sweet, they're nice. They've always been great interactions. Um, it's just, you know, more, it's more male-centric humor. It's from a male point of view, you know? But my wife, once I brought her in, you know, they all like her and they're like, why are you putting up with this idiot? And so it's, it's been fun just to play with that. Yeah. I think it's, it's so cool that you guys can, can do that. I mean, it, it reminds me of, have you seen the Ali Wong's specials? I love Ali Wong. She's, she's amazing. Brilliant. Genius. I mean, I think stand up comedians and, and satire in general, it's one of the most important mediums in the world. I agree. Yeah. Now yeah. more than ever. Yeah, that's how we learn. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who are your... F Sorry, I, I was just going to say, I thought about this today in the water. Uh, and I think about it often. I'm astounded, astounded at people's lack of awareness. Again, sense of humor. It literally is some people have a sense of satire when a person's not you know, when they're joking and they're not joking. And then some, a lot, a lot more than you would ever imagine, do not. And it is fascinating to me because I can spot it a mile away, but then I've have to realize that nobody thinks just like you think, nobody thinks exactly like I think. And that's helped me grow. But like in the beginning, I was just like, you thought that was real? But that's where all the fun stuff came for me because you're just messing with people's heads. And all I ever want at the end of the day is for people to laugh because life is really difficult if you can't do that. So, yeah. I think it's, it's both, right? You get the people that, that, that get the satire and that laugh. But the ones that think it's serious, they're almost the ones that need to watch it because it's hitting, it's hitting them somewhere where it really hurts. Yeah. And I don't know 
maybe it was your upbringing, but then there's people that are just like, I've met people that, that you would think they don't have a sense of humor. They do. It's just very, very different from yours. And they'll start laughing at something that you're like, whoa, like you are just, you're, we're seeing the world completely different and that's fine. But, and that's why there's comedians people love and comedians people hate. And even the greats, like unequivocally, we could say this person is at the top of his or her game, the greatest comedians that we have alive right now. And then we'll be somebody right around the corner and go, they're garbage. I didn't laugh at all. It's like music. It's a hundred percent how you're interpreting it through your ears into your brain. Who are your favorites? I loved, loved the late, great Norm MacDonald who passed away. Um, his specials on Netflix. I loved his show. I just think he was so brilliant. He, he never, he was on Saturday Night Live when he was younger, been a stand up forever. And he had some shows. He had a lot of stuff that kind of fell through, but I think that's because he's one of those real ones. Again, with anything in life, you can play the game and you should, if you want to get to a certain place. Some people don't play the game. They're the real wild ones and they're usually the funniest. And he did not play the game, but he, he he walked the line beautifully and just mastered his craft and presented it in a way that was so funny to me. Um, I love him. I love Bill Burr. Bill Burr is another guy that I saw with my wife right before he blew up. And we saw him before a performance in a restaurant and I walked up to him because, again, I told you I, I will do that. Because I see somebody that I, I'm a fan of and I want to walk up to them and say, thanks for making me laugh all these years. And they'll go, thanks for laughing. It's just a nice exchange. And he was just so warm and incredible. And watching him, he's an absolute master. He's a, he's a beast at mm. stand-up comedy. Um, yeah, he's one of my favorites. And so vulnerable and honest and self-aware on his podcast and genius genius yeah and what is genius what do you think genius is uh self-knowledge and acceptance and then once once you know who you are what you want and what your craft is then it's you're on the path to getting better at that and sharing it that's genius what does that mean does that mean that there's a lot of unused genius out there because there's it lies in all of us doesn't it then totally it's a hundred percent does I thought that word my whole life was a um, unattainable thing. You think Einstein did it up. Well, guess what? No, your strengths, when I'm saying your strengths and leaning into them, that is your genius. You have a particular gift, maybe multiple gifts in certain areas. And if you continually tell yourself that you're a genius at it, guess what? Someday someone's going to tell you that you are. And that's all it is. Thinking a different way, presenting information in a different place, making a product that changes the world, packaging things differently. If you have an ability to speak, perhaps you could be the greatest speaker of all time. Why not? It's just you. You're only here for a minute. So that word genius, I don't think it should be loosely thrown around, but I think it lies in every single human being. I agree. There's a saying it reminds me of is you can be whatever you want in this world. It's just, you don't get to choose what that is. See that? You have, to dis- yes. you have to discover what that is. So that is that is the thing. You would hear, you hear somebody say that on a podcast and I used to hear that and I'm like, Whoa, and I get all defensive and mad. Like, what? what's this person saying? That's ridiculous to say that. But slow down. Don't get defensive when you hear that and relax. Slow your heart rate, slow your breathing and just think for a minute. Just think for a minute. Think about your choices because choices are truly everything. Do I go right here? Do I go left here? How did this choice affect my present place where I'm at? How will this choice now, if I stop this thing, affect my future path? You start playing that game in your head. And even if you go go across all levels of intelligence, if you can play that game well, You can manage life very, very easily. You simply look at your own story from where it began, 
Maybe it was the choices other people made, your mom and dad. Maybe it was a choice a bully made towards you, this and that. And you start looking and you're like, oh, whoa, I believed all this stuff about myself. Now I'm an adult and I think I'm this person. Well, that's because this person said this or I made that choice or that person in my life made that bad decision and now I'm stuck here. But you're not stuck there. This is your life. You can stop right now and start to manage that stuff, change course, set a different direction, 100%, absolutely, all day. But you need to get rid of some thinking issues, some bad habits, and then we have a lot better human beings all around the planet. But that's very difficult Probably. because the pain, the pain, the self-doubt, the anxiety, all of those things are very, very potent. And we respond as human beings very poorly to all that stuff. And then you look around and you look at all the mechanisms of control that control large groups of people, you know, and how you were brought up in school, what you were taught and this and that. So the truth is, it's your life. You're free to do as you please. So start at that point. Mm. And then think about your, yes. sto think about your story, how you got to where you're at. Is that really who you are? Hmm. Chances are when you were young, you had a pretty good idea of what your dreams were. Somewhere along the way, they got crushed. You forgot about them, but you didn't really forget about them. They're still there. They're just lying dormant. And that is the blah, 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 your purpose. Why there's a zillion books in the world and all these authors make all this money. We're going to help you find your purpose. You don't need to read a book. Maybe if it helps you, but it's there. You just, you just forgot about it. Find it. Reminds me of another saying, when the, the voices and opinions on the inside become louder than the voices and opinions on the outside, you've begun to master your life. I love it. That's really good. I haven't heard that. That's true. Mm. So when that transition happened for you, 2018-ish, I'm wondering, how did that affect your surfing? And not just the way you surfed, but your enjoyment of surfing. I'm... I'm enjoying surfing more than I ever have in my life. And I look at it completely different because it gave me literally everything I have, this one activity. And I, I don't think it has to be surfing. It could be something different for anybody, whatever it is. It could be judo. It could be martial arts. It could be climbing. It could be hiking. But for me, I am so appreciative that I have a physical body, eyesight, hearing, movement, good joints. When I was surfing today, it was good size and it was low tide. And I felt so relaxed because I'm happy. I'm in a place in life and I could care less how many waves I got. I wasn't concerned with guys yelling at each other, burning each other. I was just simply enjoying it. And I don't meditate. But people that do, they talk about being present. The only thing I can tell you is that I have felt very present, in particular, since I quit drinking, only because I'm healthy and my mind's not racing. I'm not worried about the future because the truth is I have some control over where I go, but not really. And I'm fine with that. And I'm not thinking about the past because I know that the past is what led me right here. So then I'm just beautifully feeling content right now in the moment. And surfing, I realize now, is why I loved it so much. Because when I got up on a wave, and I know this is going to sound cheesy, because it always does, because it's such a beautiful, wonderful thing that we get to do, time stops for a second. And that's what I wanted in my life. I wanted in my brain. That's why I surfed. I wanted things to slow down, to not be thinking about the past, to not be worried about the future. I'm just riding this wave, going down the line for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, you know, five seconds. And in that moment, I'm in the moment. And that's why people surf, whether they know it or not. That is why your dopamine goes through the roof. That's how you're supposed to feel all the time. And so all these little jokes and like how Hollywood always gets it wrong, 
Sometimes books get it right. Barbarian Days, I think it's the best book ever written about surfing. If you haven't read it, read it. But it is a, it is a metaphor for life. You know, those moments of stillness, those moments of pleasure, um, you can be there all the time. It's all between your ears. But again, you got to figure out this computer. You got to figure out this wiring. We're all different. I can't ingest certain things that other people can ingest. I have to eat a certain way. I have to sleep a certain way in order for this vehicle to operate the way it was supposed to when I came on to planet Earth. And anybody can do that. It's a gift. That's life. But so many people are in a sleep mode, just running on autopilot all day, every day. But that doesn't benefit anybody. It doesn't benefit their family. It doesn't benefit their employer. It doesn't benefit humanity, certainly. It doesn't benefit the lineup attitude either. doesn't. But that's just become understanding that and then seeing folks that are grumpy or upset I realize that they're just carrying whatever they did from land into the water. And it's as simple as that. And I understand that. And then you have a sense of compassion, which is just like, hey, maybe this guy needs me to tell him, great turn. I'm amazed at the effect that's had on people. Like to where I'll say to grown men that look have the scowl, like so angry, I'll go, dude, that was a sick wave. Or the ladies, remember, dude, is universal. I'll say that was a that was a beautiful wave. You surfed it really good, and they look mean and upset, and they'll go, "No, it did. what? No, it, I didn't." And I'm like, I, "Maybe you didn't think it was, but I saw it, and you surfed that thing great." And then you start a dialogue because you just broke down a barrier. That's just basic communication. The thing with our world right now, with podcasts, with which are wonderful. With the internet, with computers, with screens, with devices, is our level of social intelligence has gone down so low. It's so bad. And that's not the way we were designed. And probably in the future, they'll teach social interaction to generations of children that just can't shake a hand, make eye contact, can't get off their phone for two seconds. But we're not designed to live like that. And so social intelligence, being aware of the people around you, their faces, recognizing their emotions, their physicality, the energy that they're putting out. If you can figure that out, the world is your oyster. You can go anywhere in the world and do anything you want if you have a high level of social intelligence. The the compliments you've started to make, do you think you would have done that before not always no not always i had just as hot a temper as anybody and um not as anybody (laughs) that's not true but i had my moments for sure even even in the last you know few years and when i had those moments i would go on instagram and talk about them because i knew that other people had those moments i don't know if that was always the best decision but now especially if people recognize you. Um, I need to be on my best behavior because you never know who's watching. You never know what little ears are listening. And I have found meeting some of my heroes that it wasn't, it wasn't, they're just humans, you know, they're just people. But the ones that really had a profound effect on me were the honest ones, the ones who admitted their mistakes, the ones who are trying to get better and lead better lives. So they're also the ones who end up enjoying surfing more and progressing faster too. And it, we bring it back to surfing. I base all my choices, not all my choices, but you, 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 dude, I should write a list. It's not good on surfing, but one of them is I would like to do this activity as long as I can. And so that then means I can't get depressed. I can't get out of shape. I can't get unhealthy. I got to protect my joints. I probably have to lift weights if I'm going to have the body frame to surf when I'm 80 years old. Um, But that's all a win-win. Like if it all comes back to surfing, that's really healthy. Is it an obsession? Absolutely. But is it a healthy obsession? Yes. 
I t- totally agree. Yeah, we all need something. And mm-hmm. well, obviously for you and I and everyone who's listening to this, it's surfing. I actually went for, I went for years of my life, like trying to th- deny that part of me. Oh, no, no, no. So sur- surfing can't, no. Nah. And it's, it, it, ho- it's hopeless. It's like you just admit you're a surfer, you love surfing. And if surfing motivates you to, to eat healthy and all those other good things in life, then just own it. And, and if the person, the partner in your life doesn't understand that, that's probably the wrong person. Amen. Let's, let's stop there for a second and talk about that one. That's a decision that so many people get wrong. That is a vital, crucial moment in your life, who you choose to be with. My wife surfs. I surf. Ding, 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 ding. My wife rides similar boards. That wasn't by mistake. That was one of the reasons that attracted me to her and her to me. She understood it completely. Not that that has to be the case for everybody, but somebody that understands that this time is what gives you peace. It's what gives you hope. It's what at times keeps you going in this world because at my lowest points, my lowest points, I still surfed. I still surfed. I'd be miserable and it would just make me feel 3% better. And to have a partner that doesn't understand that, that's not the right person (laughs) at all. You know, that's very odd to me, but so many people get that that partner thing wrong. And there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of chemicals involved, as we all know, in our bodies when we meet somebody we're attracted to, especially when you're younger. It's very difficult. But similar interests is a really great starting point, in my opinion. Yes. And it doesn't have to be that deep of an understanding, but there does have to be a radical acceptance. Mm Mm-hmm. And you of them, whatever their thing is, you know, it's, again, it's, we complicate so many things and it's not complicated. It's simple, but love and lust are two very different things. And a lot of people get those confused. And then there's just, there's societal pressures, there's parent pressures, there's things you think you're supposed to do that you don't have to do, but you do them anyways. And you just watch things happen all day. And then, God forbid, you get children involved in that situation. And we all know what happens then. It's not good. Again, if people took a moment to step back, step outside their body, look down at their lives as if they're looking down, looking at the past, they're elevated, they're looking down at the earth, where whoever you are, you're looking at yourself and you're like, that's where I came from. This is where I'm at. That's my future. If you can pretend you're 90 years old and you did all the things you wanted to do with your life, but you're 25 years old, well, just use your imagination because that's what the imagination's for. And you will go, oh, okay, how did I get to 90 and be this incredible person? Well, I must have stopped doing this, that, and the other thing. I was with this type of person. I surrounded myself with people who encouraged me. I made good choices, not dumb ones, because I'm not dumb. Maybe somebody told me I'm dumb, but that's not true. I could be smart. Heck, I could be a genius, right? So then you go from there and you just use your imagination. That's why Einstein said imagination is the most important thing, because it is. That's how you get to all the other things. Mm. Dang, this is good. I should... I should uh, do this podcast more. I'm just kidding, you guys. I hope this helps you. And this is what helped me, listening to strangers talk. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. No, I've I've been obsessed with podcasts for years. Yes. I mean, I made that mistake. I, I chose a fun relationship over a functional one. And because I didn't, I didn't do what you just said use my imagination and, and do the research and I have since and I've learned. But Well, I did you have good examples growing up? No. 
Hell no. No, I didn't. I didn't. For, for years, I didn't even know what a functional relationship was. There you go. I didn't learn how to be in. So why would, so don't, why would you ever beat yourself up for a second? From the time you're a little baby, you, you just hadn't, you, that wasn't in your toolbox. The important thing is you recognize that. A lot of people don't even come to recognition. I talk to people all the time that aren't even at that point yet. But then when they're at a point where they're like, oh, and there's a little, little self-acceptance of like, yeah, you know, okay. And, and, and ownership of whatever it was, then you can really start to make some traction as a human being and go some places. But so many people don't do that. But again, if you came from chaos and you had no example, well, I mean, your frontal cortex isn't developed till you're 25. Judgment, all that. So when you see young people just blah, they're literally, that's part of who they are. And for me, I did not start to put the pieces together till I was almost 40 and I'm still putting them together every single day. And I'm like, this is astonishing. Thank you, God, that you let me not die before I got here. Like, whoa, please let me keep living because I'm just, just scratching the surface of like what it even means, you know? It reminds me, there's a book called Models by Mark Manson, which basically describes what a functional relationship is and how to be in one. So if anyone is listening who's in, uh, wants to learn more, go there. But there's something else you've been open, um, very open with recently, and you've already mentioned a couple of times um, during this podcast, is you've quit drinking. Mm-hmm. What inspired that? Why do you got, can you send a beer through the, through the airwaves right now? No, I'm just kidding. Um, what inspired me was what you're hearing right now, like me talking, this is who I am. And I like this. I like me. And before I was 17 years old, this is who I was. And I feel like I could have done something with my life that different than what I did. Now, am I, am I upset? Not really, because life's good. And like, I've been fortunate, you know, like I said, not to get, you know, to, to screw up this path too bad, but I have along the way all because of self-sabotage and I can pinpoint the moment from my first sip of alcohol, uh, where that went sideways. I love pleasure. I love pleasure. And what did alcohol do for me? It's a depressant. It slowed this brain down. And I'm, I'm thinking all the time about everything, big questions, little questions. So booze made it extremely easy to play the fool and have a great time doing it all day, every day. Cause our culture, like that's what we, that's what we do. Like we, that's how we socialize in particular as men, it becomes a bonding ritual. And I stayed there for so long, 25 years a quarter of a century, a quarter of a century, just partying and, and, and thinking I was having a great time, but the entire time I really wasn't because the thought and the desire to quit was there from the beginning. It was just like, I, this is like, what am I doing? This is slowing me down. This is affecting my health. And I said on the Surf Splendor podcast, if I could remove one thing from my life that would affect my life for the better, I said a hundred different ways. It's I, 500, a thousand, 10,000 different ways. It would be removing this one thing. And then going, I'm not in love with this thing. Like, this is just a bad habit do can people stop bad habits well yeah well it usually takes 30 days you always read that and i was like okay and my wife being a person one of those real people who will tell you the truth i was not listening for years again i said this as well if you're semi-charming and make jokes about things you can get away with a lot. And that was my classic go-to move, you know, and then just keep doing 
the bad habit. And I finally went like, there's a whole nother side to life that I remember when I was young. It's faded in the past, but like I was a very happy high schooler. You know, a lot of high schoolers aren't. I wasn't. I was happy junior high. I was with the exception of seventh grade. That was a rough year. Yeah, yeah. But it's okay. It's all right. I got past it. But just knowing my baseline, who I am, I was like, this is serving me no good, no good purpose whatsoever. And knowing for 25 years, I've had this thought and I'm sick and tired of having this thought. Like, well, you did the social media thing when you were a wasteoid. You, you jumped across fear right there. You're doing that all day, every day now, venturing out. How about for yourself? Take a risk, John. Like, what, what good could come from this? All the things I just said to you on this podcast, saying all those things to you. The one thing I do not want to be is a hypocrite in my life. Okay? So if I'm promoting health, <laughs> but I'm a waste, wasted every night, what is that? That is hypocrisy at its finest. And I can tell you there are many people, some highly successful people, who you may look up to, who are not what you think they are. And I know this because, again, I have a high understanding of people. That's just, I get it. And I was like, you are not that person. You know who you are. You know your heart. You know what's in your heart. And this ain't you. And this is affecting everything negatively. So I did. I quit. And it's the best, one of the best decisions I've ever made. And I just think no one talks about it. Men don't talk about it. Women don't talk about it. It's just, I'm the beer guy or I drink wine every night. I pot, I, you know, it's just, uh, that's, it's your life. I'm not ever going to beat, beat anybody over the head with it. All I can say is people talk to me and that really helped me tremendously. And it's your decision. But again, the clean vessel. Like you want to reach your maximum potential as a human being before you take your dirt nap. Well, again, simple, clean out, clean out your house, man. And you're, you are the house. You are the car. These are, these are metaphors. This is your human being and human beings run optimally on the best fuel without all this added bullshit in it. And so if you're going to maximize your potential as a human, which is what the world needs so that you, before you die, can help others, that's something you might want to think about. Totally. Yeah, there's a lot of shame wrapped in being honest about it and even honest with ourselves. And the thing is, it's just it, – it, oh, there's probably people listening going, oh, I'm in control of my drinking. I'm not a drunk. I don't get wasted. I just have one or two beers every night. Well, hold on. Hold on. What would you be without those one or two beers a night? Because that's – that's in my opinion, it's not as bad as getting wasted and being dysfunctional. But it's it's a crux. Look, my wife didn't think I have a pro – this is how good – of a, of a, how, how, how I can trick people and trick myself. I've lived with this woman, slept in the same bed with her for almost 14 years. She did not fully grasp that I had a problem, even though I've said it this entire time. I've said what I just said, bet she it's alcohol, bet she it's like, if I could remove that, I'd be good. And then I'd come home and there's a 24 pack. That's not because, you know, she, she thought I was an alcoholic and she's an enabler. She thought it was all well and good because I could just go about my life. I reached a professional level of drinking, like pro level, like scumbag, right? To where nobody knows. I had a talk with my neighbor who I've lived here for a decade next to. He's like, dude, I had no idea. I'm like, yeah, it's because I was doing it in private. I was doing it after people went to sleep at night and I'm watching Netflix because I love to get whammied. I'm like, yeah, we're off to, I'm having my own private party every day and it's fun. I get to be sneaky. Like, and then you're just like, 
that's your your standard operating procedure is that's who that's what you do and then everywhere you go you're going on a business trip you're in a hotel you're like it's my private party 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 and then it's like what are we what are we doing here so of course nobody knows and then you're reading the list like what is an alcoholic it's like number 1 do you drink by yourself of course who doesn't like yeah isn't that the point and then you read all the other stuff so i mean to each their own you know yourself better than anybody so you just have to answer these questions um but i was kidding myself for a long time but that thought was always there like damn you just stop this like we could probably do some things can I, can, I, life. can I ask you on a, on a practical level, right? You go, you, let's just hypothetically, and this may not be you, but let's just say every, every night, once the kids are in bed, there's two or three drinks and there's a couple hours of Netflix or dicking around, which mm-hmm. is essentially a waste of time. What did you replace that with? Work that I'm passionate about. Okay, so that's a couple of hours every day. It's a couple Times. of hours every day. Yeah, more work and working on your passion. So just let's just let that sink into people. You'll re- like that's huge. Okay, let's let this sink sink into people. I had a call with a guy the other day who goes, "I think I'm a writer." I go, "You think you're a writer?" Okay, you call. This is a stranger that heard me on another podcast, and I I could care less. Like gave my, I'm like DM me, like yeah, I'll actually talk to you. We can, I'm not doing this for the pod. Like we could have the same conversation. Maybe not from New Zealand, unless you're paying the phone bill, but I'm just kidding. Sure. We'll, we'll figure it out. But we had this conversation. I go, the fact that you're asking if you're a writer means you're a writer. That's what you are. You wouldn't have got, you would and he goes, it was very scary for me to DM you and then to like actually call your phone number. I'm like, well, you did that, didn't you? So that's step that's step one. That's what you are. Okay. Maybe nobody ever told you it. I'll tell you it. The imposter at anything is wildly overconfident. Think of all the one uppers we know. I'm great at this. I'm great at that. La la. They're usually not. The person who's insecure and's like, I think I'm an artist. <sighs> I don't know that I am. That's the artist. That is. Okay. Can you say the can you say the question again one more time? I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought because I just love art. I got so excited for a minute. <laughs> you, you, and you've answered it. I mean, that's the thing. It's just, if you if you have a couple of drinks, then that just quiet that just quietens that voice to a level where it it's it's not going to come up. But if you take the drinks away, it's going to come up, and you're going to start next thing you know. Instead of drinking every night, you're painting or you're doing whatever. Okay, your art is. so instead of watching Netflix. You are writing a show for Netflix, which will potentially make you another house. Why? Because they're going to pay you for it. So instead of watching it, you are at night spending your time writing. Huh? That's how that works? You mean they're just people and they're, they're not like doing this or th- Yeah, I assure you. that's how it works. The people that do things actually do things. And it's not difficult. You could do it too. But you have to have a basic level of time management. And I'm the worst my entire life. I am a professional level procrastinator. But if you are doing something that you enjoy and you're seeing fruits from your labor, what's better than that? Nothing in the world. So instead of watching something at night, you're creating something. Guess what comes from creating? Lots of cheddar in your bank account. Why? That's our world. And that's what you are. Don't wait. Don't wait, create. You do it now. And maybe you stink at first, but you get better and you self-correct. With that being said, to my delusional friends out there, are you, are you truly, truly delusional? 
Or are you not delusional? Because we all know people with a guitar who have been going at their music for how many years, and you're like, hmm, I don't know if they got it. Maybe they got it, but they're hitting the bong three times a day. Maybe they got it, but they have a lot of trauma they haven't dealt with. Or maybe they didn't. Maybe that is not their particular strength. They think it is, and they think they're, but maybe it's not. So you have to be brutally honest with yourself now when you hear this right now. That's the thing. That's the secret. Starting. It's not a secret. But that is the secret. You have to clean your house and start. And you suck when you start. Everybody does. Bill Burr did. Dave Chappelle did. Everyone did. Claude, Claude Monet, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci. They did. But you tell yourself you're a genius. Not out loud, because when you say it out loud, people look at you funny. You say it to your yourself. You go, yeah. And if nobody's around you to build you up and give you that self-confidence, you go find them because they're there. It could be an old man who's your neighbor who you've never talked to. It could be somebody up, whatever. If it's in your home, if you're hearing constant, constant negative chatter, before you go to bed at night, you think to yourself very hard and you go, oh, I'm in a house of lies. None of them know who I am. I know who I am. They'll see one day and you channel it and you use it as fuel. That's what haters are. Haters are great. And they can be from your own family. And guess what? It's sweet, sweet, sweet revenge success. There's nothing greater. Not because you're a jerk, not because you're conceited, not because you're going to rub it in, but because you became what you knew you could be. Simple. Love it. Where can people find you on Instagram? I quit just now. I retired. This podcast made me realize that I could do better things than use the app that Facebook created, which gives me strikes and penalties for just being myself and saying words. I'm moving to the Twitter Twitterverse because Elon says it's going to be about freedom. So you guys can find me. No, I, I'm, I will be right here. It's my name. Why did I make it my name? My full name is at, actually, there's no at. My parents didn't give me that. The, the nerds that created the computer algorithms gave me that. My name's Jonathan Wayne Freeman, at Jonathan Wayne Freeman. If you heard anything that resonated with you, you can DM me. I love to talk to people. Um, yeah, that's where I'm at. And then please follow at Kook of the Day. Um, I love working for them. I love working for a company called Bug Assault. Um, I love working for a company called New Greens and Pure Prescriptions. They're all people who have supported this goofball from the beginning. I work for a company called Pip Viper Sunglasses. They've supported me from the beginning. And there's a million, not a million, I hope it's a million one day, but there's dozens of people that are real human beings that I never mention who have taken a moment to encourage me to speak with me. There's hundreds online that have come to me and said, keep doing what you're doing. Keep pushing. I don't know where it's going. I'm not sure what you're doing, but I like it. And that helps me figure out what I am doing. And it's constantly evolving. Everything I'm talking about here, I'm an open book. So that's all my Instagram page has ever been is just sometimes it's fake. Sometimes it's real. It's mostly a mix of both. And what you're watching is a human being who knows where he's going. You could come with me and do your own thing. Or you can sit and watch and talk shit. But I would never do that. So that's why I'm a little bit disturbed by that. But then you have to realize we're all different. We're all in different places. But that's where I'm at. And it's fun to some people. So... <laughs> I'm very fortunate to be asked to be on this podcast. I always dreamed of being on a podcast and now I get to do it. And it's the raddest thing in the world because I don't know whose ears are going to hear this, 
But to those of you that do hear this, I, I will say this. Okay? This is it. Right now. You are here. It's not going to happen again. This is your life. So do something with it. Do something great with it. Help people. By an act of service, that is how you will gain everything. By taking your life and turning it into its own piece of art that impacts the world. If you look at any of the great people throughout human history, they weren't necessarily special because none of us really are. What is the word special anyways? We're just human beings. You have to love everybody. You have to dream big and you have to act now. If you can do that, your life will change and you have no idea the impact it can have. It can literally, you don't know. You just don't know. So if you have that feeling inside of you that maybe that you're meant for something bigger, it's because you are. That is whatever you want to call it, the spirit Whatever your belief is, your intuition, whatever you consider that to be, that is part of nature. That is part of you. And it's there because it's telling you that there's more to this whole life than what you're experiencing now. So find out what your strengths are, get your house clean, and go forward. And then come back to me in 10 years and we'll high five. All right. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me on. That was a lot of fun. I'm going to go eat a sandwich now. I am. And it's going to taste great. Very fortunate to have these taste buds still functioning. Very happy about that. Thanks for listening. Please give John Wayne Freeman a follow on Instagram. And if you enjoyed this episode please share it with a couple of friends and consider some non-surfer friends too. And if you could give us a rating on the app you're using, that'd be awesome too. Until next time, keep surfing.